Have you ever had a bad boss? I was talking to someone from our church recently, and uh, they've got a really difficult boss. He micromanages them. Uh, when he explains something to them, he treats them as if they were a child. And this is someone who is really, really sharp. Uh, he will take credit for things that they have done. He gaslights, he mansplains, he rationalizes. And so when they'll come to him with, here's a problem that we're having, um, he will then explain to them how it's actually not a problem at all. Now, he doesn't know what he's talking about, but that's the way he makes it sound. He's a master manipulator, and he has a temper. Not an easy guy to work for. Well, I read online several uh, sites this week um, about people who had bad bosses, and one of them on Muse.com, a person wrote this. My first job out of college was in sales, but it operated more like a call center. As a result of the high volume of incoming calls, every rep was required to be at, on the phone and at their desk at all times. That meant we had a bathroom request button on our computers. Anytime you had to use the bathroom, you'd click the button, cross your fingers or legs, and hope for the best. The request got kicked up to my not so great manager and nine times out of 10, the request would be denied immediately. So Reader's Digest had sh readers share their stories and one of them, Elizabeth B. from Georgia wrote this. After I'd been working in a small marketing agency for two years, my boss called me in the, in the office. He told me I was finally receiving a promotion and a raise. I was elated. But when I reminded him about it the next day, he reneged on it. I started to argue, but he cut, cut me off and he said, you know better than to take me seriously in the afternoons. I'm always drunk in the afternoon. Wow, that's, that's a great boss. Well, Bona Backenheimer from Long Beach, California wrote, it was a typical hectic Friday afternoon at our law office. My boss, Mean Mile, was hundreds of miles away at a luxury resort preparing for a meeting. In the midst of my insane day, I got an urgent call from him. You have to phone the hotel right away. It's important, he, my boss said. Ask them to send someone to the pool area immediately. What's wrong, I asked. We haven't seen a waiter in 20 minutes, and our drinks need to be refreshed. Well, finally, Tamara T. from Nebraska wrote, Although it wasn't my job, my boss once made me mow the lawn around our office building. I was wearing a dress and high heels. Wow, nice. Talk about bad bosses. I hope you never have a boss like that. Well, last week we met Jacob, who was working for his uncle Laban. Spent 14 years laboring under a guy who really was a bad boss, who was taking advantage of him. And if you're with us, you know that uh, Laban swindled him into working seven, seven extra years. And so, so far in our series, we started out, we saw Jacob swindle his own brother out of his birthright. He then went on to trick his father into giving him his blessing. And then he sees Uncle, Jabin, Uncle Laban, who has him marry a woman that he did not want to marry by having him wake up in the morning to find out, wait, this is the wrong one of the daughters that's with me. Now, the life of Jacob helps us to see some very important truth, which is that God is the architect of the blessed life. God takes a sneaky man like Jacob, who himself is a deceiver, and he meets his match in Laban, and eventually realizes that God is the one who has to take charge. And God does end up blessing him. You know, I'm happy to know that God works in the lives of people like Jacob. One of the things I love about the Bible is normally when you hear stories about heroes, it's just the good things about them. Often biographies of heroes, it's just about how amazing they were. And the Bible talks about their good things, but also the terrible things. Abraham, Father Abraham, the, the great beginning patriarch. I mean, the guy does some things, you're like, that's terrible. Here, Jacob, another one of the patriarchs, just repeatedly, you see him going like, really, Jacob, you did that next? I appreciate it because as a flawed person, it's wonderful to know that the people in the Bible we read about weren't perfect. Now, if, let me set the context. Today, Genesis, we're going to be in chapters 30 and 31, and I want to consider that. Um, before I do, I'm going to forget to say something if I don't do it now, and I do want to do it now. Um, oh, I was going to mention, um, not calling your husband out. I, Laura's at the back there. Her husband, Juan, is our bass player, and uh, um, 
Juan has been amazing. He's been with us for many years, and I just so love him. They're moving, I'm pointing them out, as they're moving away this weekend to Pennsylvania. Um, I tried to be clear it wasn't God's will for them. The Lord wasn't in this. Um, he, for some reason, people don't listen to me, um, including my dog, just pretty much nobody. Uh, so anyway, I do want to just acknowledge Juan and Laura. We love them so much, and they will be sorely missed. Laura is just such a joyful person who loves the Lord and uh, loves to talk to people, and then their beautiful little baby, Abigail. So we will miss them very, very much, um, but uh, we're thankful you could be here one last time. And they are moving on Saturday, so uh, I don't know if you guys are close to having enough people, but we do need hands to help. Um, Jeff, do you know, how, are we? Okay, and how, on our website, or where they go to find that? Just so you can email the church office and we can let you know if you're interested in helping. Anyway, I want to get back to this, but I, I didn't want to miss that opportunity to acknowledge them. Okay, so in our context today, if you've been here with us for the past month, Jacob starts out, he's at home in Beersheba with his family. He steals his brother's blessing. Brother Esau is mad and decides, says, I'm going to kill him. These are both adult men, by the way. These aren't like teenagers. And says, I'm going to kill him. And so Jacob flees. And he gets away, and he goes up north 500 miles, what would have been an incredibly long journey in that time, from what is today lower Israel all the way up into modern-day Turkey. Well, while in Haran, the, country, the city he goes to, Jacob met the love of his life, Rachel. Now, he had no dowry to give the father, no money to give the family, and so Laban, her father, says, you can work for seven years, and then you may marry my daughter, Again, he has a celebration. The next morning wakes up and discovers he was given the other daughter. Laban then says, well, you can have Rachel also, but you'll have to work another seven years. And so Jacob has worked 14 years of his life for this guy, Laban. Now he can finally hand in his resignation. Genesis chapter 30, verse 25, we read, After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me on my way so I can go back to my own homeland. Give me my wives and children for whom I have served you and I will be on my way. You know how much work I've done for you. So Jacob is ready to leave, but Laban does not want to lose this excellent worker. The situation has been a great deal. Really just for room and board, he has had 14 years of this guy working hard for him and he has been blessed because of it. Well, Laban doesn't want him to leave, so his response in verse 27. But Laban said to him, If I found favor in your eyes, please stay. I've learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. And then he added, Name your wages, and I will pay them. Now, is Laban suddenly being kind, maybe even generous? Well, no, not at all. His flocks have been blessed in an amazing way since Jacob took over. And, and he knows the best thing for him is to hold on. To this great worker who seems to be blessed by God. But there's also something else he knows that we don't necessarily understand at this point, and that's that Jacob has nothing. I mean, this guy has worked for 14 years and just has the clothes on his back, his walking stick, and his new family. While his father-in-law has been blessed, Jacob seems to have missed out on it. Verse 29, Jacob said to him, you know how, how I've worked for you and how your livestock has fared under my care. The little you had before I came has increased greatly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I have been. But now when may I do something for my own household? So Jacob's getting older. He lost his inheritance from his family when he fled from his older brother Esau. He's then spent 14 precious years, the prime of his life, working for this slimy guy, Laban. He must do something or he's going to wind up completely destitute. Laban has been blessed because of him, but he has not been blessed. Now, 14 years to us, that's a long time. But the average American lives to be in to their mid-70s. I uh, Googled and researched some, and they said typically in older times, even just a couple of hundred years ago, 35 was a very standard lifespan. Now, they did point out in the article I read that about a third of those would be infant deaths, so it skews the number lower, but, you know, 45 was good. 50, you would be, like, considered old at the age of 50, or as I call it, young. Um, that's what I call 50. 
I know the young people here, you all think 50 is old. But honestly, in our generation, 50 is not what it was back then. So understand this, 14 years of his life, your first, you know, 14, 15, 16 years of your life, you know, you're young, then you're a teenager, maybe you're working some. But now he spent 14 more years. So literally half of his life has been spent either as a teenager or else working, and he has nothing to show for it. And so he needs to make up for what he's lost. Verse 31. What shall I give you, Laban asked. Don't give me anything, Jacob replied. But if you will do this one thing for me, I will go on tending your flocks and watching over them. Let me go through all your flocks today and remove from them every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark-colored lamb, and every spotted or speckled goat. They'll be my wages. And my honesty will testify for me in the future whenever you check on the wages you've paid me. Any goat in my possession that's not speckled or spotted or any lamb that's not dark-colored, will be considered stolen. Agreed, said Laban. Let it be as you have said. So it turns out Jacob has something up his sleeve. He agrees he will continue to shepherd the flocks. Previously, again, room and board is what he's working for and to get these wives, but now he wants a different wage. In ancient times, it was not uncommon for shepherds to be paid 20% of the births of the animals born under their care. In other words, if you had 10 sheep uh, giving birth, then two of those would be yours. And so he's not proposing this, though. He has a whole different idea. Uh, and it's a rather strange one. He proposes that the sheep that aren't born white, they're either dark or multicolored, will belong to Jacob. Now, anyone who knows sheep knows if you see sheep, they're almost always white. So he's saying that kind of I'll take just the ones that aren't the normal sheep. Same thing with the goats. Goats tend to be dark. He says, I'll take the spotted or striped ones. Again, much less than 20% likelihood. So Laban, who we have seen, is just a guy who loves to scam other people. He is excited about this. Jacob has come up with a deal that Laban's like, yes, I agree. Let's, let's do this. Well, after hearing this proposal... We want to shake our head because thinking, like, what is Jacob doing? This is not a good deal. Well, they divide the flocks, and to be safe, Laban puts his sheep under and goats under the care of his own sons. And then to be even safer, he separates the flocks by three days, has them go in opposite directions for three days just to be sure Jacob doesn't end up coming back and taking some of his flocks. Now, Jacob, though, he has a scheme. What follows is confusing, and I'm, I'm not going to read it in the scripture. It's rather long, and I'm going to instead just explain it. Jacob takes some sticks from three different kinds of trees. He peels off their bark, leaving streaks in the wood. In other words, he creates branches that looks like he wants the sheep and goats to look, that they're spotted, that they're striped, that they're not a uniform color. He then places them either in the watering troughs or around them, which is where the animals would normally mate. And he is apparently acting in accordance with an ancient belief that an animal or person who sees something during conception will be influenced by it and the characteristics will end up in their offspring. So he thinks by putting, you know, striped wood or on the, in the trough or on the ground that his animals are going to end up with the stripes that will make them his instead of Laban's. Well, verse 43. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. So it ends up that over the next six years, the scheme actually works. And his flock has grown and grown and grown. He's worked to pay off Laban. Again, seven of those years, he was tricked into working. He had virtually nothing, but now God has blessed him, and he is wealthy. Matter of fact, he's so wealthy that in chapter 32, just a couple chapters later, Jacob's going to send his brother Esau, who may or may not still want to kill him, some things as a gift to try to appease him. And we're told he sent 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, and 20 rams. 30 milking camels and their calves, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. Now, yeah, none of us has donkeys. We don't have sheep. We don't have camels. But this was wealth. So anyone reading this in ancient times would have known what is being said here is, man, this guy 
he's got a lot of money. If he's sending a portion of what he owns to his brother. So God has blessed him beyond his understanding. But the question is, what do we do with a story like this? Jacob needs a flock of his own. Laban has taken advantage of him. In order to secure a flock, then, Jacob uses means that are laughable, that are misguided, and they're superstitious. And yet God blesses him anyway. In order to understand this, we need to note Jacob's character. Jacob, like most of us, wants to serve God and wants to do what God desires, but he also wants to make sure everything's okay and kind of build in some security. Fourteen years have passed since he was at Bethel, and God came down to him and revealed himself in that stairway, the angels going up and down, and there is God, and God spoke to him. From where he's standing, Jacob thinks, God hasn't been doing much to bless me at this point. Again, this is when he's first coming up with his scheme. He's thinking, i got to do something. I have nothing. How can I make this into something? Now, he eventually understood that it was God who had blessed him. We're going to read in chapter 31 in just a little bit when he shares with his wife about a dream that he had. And in the dream, he talks about how God was the one who had done this. And nowhere then does he talk about his scheme working. It wasn't like, wow, wasn't I smart? Boy, didn't I come up with something great? Doug Beckner writes, Jacob knows his blessing is due not to some plan of his own, but to God alone. When Jacob decided to do his little trick with the sticks, he was doing what we all do when faced with similar circumstances. He was being clever. His faith was getting weary, so he clung to a clever idea. But I want you to notice what God did not do here. Jacob starts putting sticks in troughs. He starts again doing this superstitious, crazy thing. And God really should have punished him. How dare you not trust me? I told you I'd bless you. What kind of man are you that you'd come up with a scheme to, to try to really get something the way you shouldn't? But that's not what God says. God doesn't even rebuke him here. God just blesses him anyway. It's a picture of God's mercy, and the good thing for us is we don't get what we deserve. God is so amazingly merciful beyond our understanding. Now, this brings us back to something we've seen previously in our series, which is we need to stop scheming to get God's blessing. God is always at work. He is the one who will take care of us. Regardless of our clever schemes, he will do what needs to be done. So we need to own up to what we've done. The problem is, Jacob and Laban, you have two guys who are both going to try to trick you and steal from you and get everything that they can. And neither of them would admit that they were at fault. Matter of fact, we'll see in a little bit how angry Laban becomes with Jacob because Jacob has been blessed. So often we too fail to admit our part in problems. Our boys were 9 and 12 when we took them skiing for the first time, and uh, it was actually the last time also. Um, they enjoyed it, but I kind of realized, like, I've reached a stage in life where I'm really likely going to get hurt eventually. So I um, said, so you guys can go with your friends, knock yourselves out, but, uh, yeah, it won't be with mom and dad. But we're there, and uh, my youngest son, David, is staying on kind of the easier slopes. He's only 9. Joel, 12 years old, very coordinated and was really catching things. So by the afternoon, we were skiing down the intermediate slopes. And uh, we're going down this, this, this slope. And over here, there's another one coming in. I believe it was a black diamond, which are the hardest ones. And I see a teenager over here flying on that slope. And coming on to the right of us, we're over to the left. To the right is another teenager just barreling down the hill. And neither of them is looking at each other. And Joel and I, I kept kind of looking back. Just you always want to know who's coming. Um, often, you'll, like, kids will clear people out if you're not careful. So you know, I'm keeping an eye, and I watch them like, uh-oh. And we, we're going to do a merge where both of ours are going to end up going down together. And I watch them as they don't look, and they don't look, and they don't look. And then, bam, they hit each other, did one of those, you know, clothes. They call it a clothes sail in skiing where your clothes go everywhere. And, you know, it's like a little bit there, a little bit there. Not only that, they take out another guy who's about 10 feet in front of them. Now, Joel and I are too far down the slope, too far to the side. There's no way to work my way back to them. But I watch to be sure they're okay. And they get up, and the teenagers uh, start talking. And then pretty soon you can see them, like, pointing fingers. And, you know, they're, they're like, clearly kind of saying, it's your fault. Why weren't you watching? It's your fault. And I'm thinking it was both your fault. Like, both of you are going into the merge. You, you both needed to be watching, but no one wanted to admit blame. So Jacob and Laban, it's the way they were. 
And so often, that's the way we are. Someone else's fault, it's not my fault. Someone else did, it's not, not me. Well, often it is me. And we need to be aware of that. Well, Jacob and Laban are a couple of schemers. They were flawed. But the difference is Jacob would learn. Jacob would eventually change, and God would bless the world through him. Sometimes we do exactly what we know God wants us to do. We're obedient to him. But other times we come up with our little schemes, our little ways of doing things. We twist things. The point is we don't have to go around worrying that God needs us to get everything right in order for him to bless us. How wonderful it is for God's people. We don't need to be, you know, taking the bark off a stick and hoping that's going to make a certain thing happen. Aren't you glad that God is gracious and merciful? Aren't you glad he doesn't give up on us when we fail and when we fall? If we'll run to him for forgiveness, he's always available. Now, at this point in the story, Jacob has a large, strong flock. Laban's not too happy about it. Not only is Laban unhappy, but his sons aren't happy either. Because what's happened is Jacob makes sure that the, the males who are mating with the females are his, the strong ones, the strongest, the best. So the two herds end up being completely different. Jacob has flocks that are strong and healthy, and Laban's are getting weaker and weaker. Verse 1 of chapter 31. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all his wealth from what belonged to our father, who, by the way, again, is so wealthy because of Jacob. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So he's noticing, like, Laban loved him before, like, free help and amazing help. And now he's not as happy, like, wait, I'm not growing in wealth the way Jacob is. So he's not happy, but guess who was happy? God. God was with Jacob. God says to him, return home, and I'll be with you. The promise God had uttered 20 years earlier at Bethel now rings with authenticity. Six years before, he, Jacob has nothing. And he's got two wives, one of them he didn't even want. But now he's experienced blessing. But would his wives see this blessing the same way he did? Verse 4. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah to come out to the fields where his flocks were. And he said to them, I see that your father's attitude towards me is not what it was before. But the God of my father has been with me. You know that I've worked for your father with all my strength. Yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages ten times. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. If he said the speckled ones will be your wages, then all the flocks gave birth to speckled young. And if he said the streaked ones will be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked young. So God has taken away your father's livestock and has given them to me. And then he shares with them a dream he had. Verse 10, in breeding season, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw that the male goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled, or spotted. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. And he said, look up. And see that all the male goats mating with the flocks are streaked, speckled, or spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I'm the God of Bethel. Where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. So God reveals in this dream quite clearly that Jacob has been blessed and successful. Not because he was so smart and came up with such a great idea with those sticks but simply because God has been gracious and has been with him. And then God reminds Jacob of the vow he made at Bethel 20 years before. He had vowed, he had said to God, I will seek you and I will serve you if you will clothe me, if you will feed me, if you'll care for me, then you will be my God. And so God is calling him back to that. Here's the thing. We don't deserve God's grace or his blessings either. But he gives them to us. Jacob was flawed, but God used him. And the challenge for us is to stop scheming, stop doing things our way, stop blaming others for our failures. I think most of us are like Jacob. When life is going as planned, then okay, God, you know, you can be in charge. But as soon as things start to fall apart, we try to take them back, try to take life into our own hands, matters into our own hands. God, I got this. 
you know, it's not going the way I wanted. I'll take care of this. We need to learn to trust God. We need to learn to understand that he is God and we need to seek after him alone and do things his way. Two years ago, my wife was promoted um, to the manager level of the uh, partial hospital psychiatric unit she works at for Rutgers University. And um, when she was offered the promotion, you know, we talked about it for a while and, you know, she really wasn't sure that she'd like the job, but the, it was like a huge increase in pay. You know, and so when she kind of talked to me about it, I'm like, well, honey, it's really up to you. You know, it's really like if you want the job that pays less or if you want the job that pays more, <laughs> it's, it's up to you. I don't have a real opinion whether you make more money or not. Um, I really told her, like, honey, it's up to you, but, you know, it'd be great. And she took the job, and uh, boy, from the beginning, it was just overwhelming, and the hours were long, the stress was never ending. Many mornings, I'd get up at 5.30 and ask, see her at the computer already, and say, well, what time did you start working? 4.30 a.m. Other nights, it'd be 10.30 at night, she was still working. Weekends, last weekend, Saturday was probably a 10-hour day. And on top of that, she hasn't been able to do ministry. And Deb has a heart for God, and she loves to do ministry. And, and she's working such long hours, and when she's finally done, she's exhausted. Um, not just, uh, you know, physically, mentally. She is just completely drained. And so she started looking at take, doing a private practice as a counselor. And, you know, something she's been talking about for a while. And I'll be honest, like, you know, it's a scary thing. And the more she started to talk about, the more I'm like, you know, I'm just thinking, like, maybe hang in there a little longer. But um, I just saw it was just wearing on her. And about six weeks ago, I said, like, like Deb, it's just time. I really think. And she's like, are you sure, Mark? Like, I know this is going to really be a hit on our family. Not only does she have a good, steady income. Every week, the check is exactly the same. We know what it's going to be. On top of that, our son, David, gets free tuition at Rutgers. Poof, that's gone. We have amazing health benefits. The state workers' benefits, they are the Cadillac of all Cadillac plans. That's the piece, quite honestly, I'm going to miss the most. Um, in addition to that, her 401k is incredibly generous. She gets five weeks of paid vacation. If she's sick, they still give her money. In private practice, if you're sick, guess what? Your clients don't go like, oh, I feel really badly. Let me take care of you. Um, this is a huge step for us. But... We finally just said, you know what? It really looks like this is what God is doing. And this is where he's leading. And I'll tell you, since she told her boss two weeks ago, it's like just this weight has been lifted. And this burden of all the problems and all the issues that 30 staff members plus uh, 100 mentally ill people bring, suddenly they're not going to be her problem. Two months from now, she'll be done. She gave them lots of notice so they could transition well. And I just see like smiles on her face that just weren't there. And she's so excited about being able to do ministry again, being able to jump in and serve in ways she hasn't been able to do. But this still has not been an easy decision. This has been a step of faith on our part. And all that, it's first of all safe. Deb, you know, Deb and I, we first say, like, would you rather know money's coming in or hope money's coming in? I don't know about you, I'd rather know it's coming in. Um, all these benefits, but the thing is, if God is in it, then you can trust him. So many times we scheme and we work and we do what we can to make successes in our lives, and God's saying, that's not what I have for you. Trust me. Believe that I will provide for you. Believe that I will lead you. So often we spend our time and our energy on things that don't matter, on those TV shows we love, our hobbies, on our jobs, and all these things that just, they pass away. What God is calling us is, remember, I'm here. I'm in charge. I will bless you. Jacob did not deserve God's blessing. God was so gracious and gave it to him anyway. We don't deserve his blessing. But if we'll seek after him, if we will surrender to Christ and follow him, God will bless us, not just financially. Sometimes he does that, sometimes not. I don't know how long it's going to take till Deb makes as much as she did before. She might never get close. I don't know. But I know God is faithful. And if he leads, then you can trust him always. So I'm wondering about you. Are you trusting Christ today? 
Are you letting God be God, or do you keep taking matters back into your own hands? I would challenge you to surrender to him. Pastor and author Max Lucado writes this, and I want to close with it. If God is able to place the stars in their sockets and suspend the sky like a curtain, do you think it's remotely possible that God is able to guide your life? If he cares enough about the planet Saturn to give it rings, or Venus to make it sparkle, is there an outside chance that he cares enough about you to meet your needs? I would say yes. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. We thank you for stories like Jacob's, this man who just fails and fails and fails again, and yet your grace just continually is there for him. And then, Father, you bless him despite who he is. Lord, I pray you would help us to understand that we need to be people who trust you with our lives. Lord, I know that there are some here today that they have decisions ahead, or there are things they're doing in life and it's destroying them. Lord, that decision ahead, they're looking at it with, um, with the eyes of humans rather than trying to see it from your perspective. Lord, I pray for each of us that we wouldn't scheme, we wouldn't work to get what we want, but that we would listen to you, that we would trust in you, and when you lead, we would go. That we would believe that you are the God who will bless us, whether now or in eternity, that you will care for those who seek after you. Father, help us. Laban was that uncle who just brought so much pain to Jacob, and yet Jacob brought so much pain upon himself. So often we do the same. Lord, may we make decisions that would lead us to become more like you, decisions that lead to blessing and to growth and to life. And Jesus, I pray this all in your name.